I've been spending the last 15 or so years studying distributed collaboration and working closely with companies that are trying to implement a distributed workforce, whether that be people working from home or um, at product development sites in different parts of the world. And as you know, and hopefully you heard in the last panel that we had here, the debate between Manny and Wade, there's a lot of discussion about should we be doing distributed work or should we not be doing distributed work within our organizations? And you know this has reached mainstream when, um, when there's a Dilbert cartoon about it. And hopefully this looks familiar to most of you because it reflects a lot of the debate that we're reading about in the press these days. Companies like IBM, Yahoo, um, McDonnell Douglas, right, are pulling back workers that have been in remote sites or working at an offshore location or from home with the goal of trying to increase coordination and collaboration within the workspace. And it's not always clear, is this the right move? Should we be pulling people back? Should we be not? The trend, certainly, as we heard this morning, has been moving towards a more distributed workforce with team members across the globe, across the country, working in a coordinated fashion on similar projects. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those statistics today. But I've got good news and I've got bad news. We, as sort of academic researchers like me, have been studying distributed workforces for about a quarter of a century now. Obviously, we've had distributed organizations for a long time. We might think of the East India Trading Company in the late 1600s as one of the first global organizations. But it was really the 1970s and the oil crisis that really spawned a lot of telecommuting, um, both in the US and internationally. And then, of course, through the 90s and 2000s, with the rise of the internet, we saw much more distributed workforce penetration. This research has shown, as I mentioned, some good things and some bad things. And I want to start with the bad. And if you're a resident of California like me, uh, this picture that you see on the screens uh, to the left and to the right of me here shouldn't be so surprising. This is the south branch of the San Andreas Fault, right near the Carrizo Plains. And if you're a Californian, you're probably an amateur seismologist, and you'll know about tectonic plates. And if you don't, let me just give you a quick layman's explanation. So the way they work is that California sits on all these, these plates under the ground, and they're constantly in pressure with one another. And as the pressure mounts over time, eventually there's a slippage, and one plate rises above the other, and it creates this fault line that you saw on the screen there just a second ago. Those fault lines um, arise when that pressure mounts. Distributed teams work in the same kind of way that as we start distributing people in different geographic locations, let's say we have our headquarters in San Mateo and we have a, um, our engineering force there and we have a marketing team in Austin, that geographic separation creates pressure that starts to, to wobble those plates just a little bit. And when we start mounting difference on top of those geographic locations, for example, um, we have more senior engineers in Silicon Valley and more junior marketers in Austin. Or we have a team that's predominantly men in Silicon Valley and a team that's predominantly women in Austin. All of those differences begin to create more pressure that can result in these fissures. And the remarkable thing, if you are to walk across the Carrizo Plains, like I did for the first time when I was about 14 years old, and you see one of these fault lines, you realize that this was once a really unified landscape. And now you can't get across from one side to the other because there are these little mountains and valleys that have arisen in, in the wake of this, of this fault. That's what happens so many times in a distributed workforce, that small differences begin to create these pressures that split even the best functioning teams. That's the bad news. The good news is we've got quite a bit of research um, helping to show what it is that helps to alleviate some of those pressures so that we don't get these gigantic splits in the landscape. And I put up here, hopefully a helpful, easy to remember, but also admittedly cheesy kind of acronym to help us think through what are some of the different things that we need to be attentive of as we're thinking about managing a distributed workforce. When we talk about structure, for example, what should the composition of teams and our distributed collaboration look like? We can talk about process. What are the things that we need to do once we've assembled those teams and we want to keep them moving in the right direction? How do we increase learning and make sure we don't stifle the learning that can happen across multiple geographic locations? Interaction. How do we seed and balance non-work and personal interaction with workplace and task-based interaction? And finally, talk. 
Even in a world of text and email and chat, talk is extremely important and the way that talk plays out across organizations and across our teams matters a lot for the success of those distributed collaborative ventures. So what I'm gonna talk about in the next few minutes are these elements of structure, process, learning, interaction, and talk split. And the goal is, and what I hope that the takeaway is, is if you remember this image of that San Andreas fault line in your mind, the way that we prevent those faults from rupturing are by attending to structure, process, learning, interaction, and talk. And I'm gonna hopefully tell you some tricks that we can use based on the sound science that we've got now of almost three decades worth of research on distributed collaboration about how we do that. Sound good? Okay, all right, so let's start with structure. Um, when I talk to executives, and I, I am fortunate to do that pretty often in my role, I often ask them, what do you do to design your team? How do you think about the design and the structure of your team? And I get a lot of blank stares when I ask that question. Um, sometimes I, I hear uh, design, what? Like, I don't design teams. Teams like show up, or it's just obvious what teams I need to put together. Um, I often hear something like, I pick people that have the right skills. Of course, we're gonna assemble teams that have people that can do the jobs that I've assigned them to do or that we need. Um, I often hear you can't, you have to go with people that you know are trusted, that can get it done, or we want people who are similar. These sound like pretty common responses. Yeah, so these are the kinds of things we typically think about when we're putting together teams. And one of the, the important underlying kind of assumptions of many of these is that either we don't pay a lot of attention to how we design teams or we fall back on trying to put people together that work well together already or that have some amount of common knowledge and experience. And that makes good intuitive sense, doesn't it? Because we don't want to put people together who have never had any experience interacting, who may get in a fight, who may not see eye to eye, who are going to take time to develop norms and build their experience up. But the research that we've done about the design of teams, especially teams that are going to be in distributed contexts, tells a slightly different story. It looks something like this on the graph that you see um, up here. What I've done is I've mapped team performance, right, high and low, across how long different kinds of teams have been together. And what you see on that red line there are teams that are formed with similar people people who have similar experience or training or who sit next to each other in the office. And the blue line are teams that are diverse. And by diverse, I don't just mean cultural or national or ethnic diversity, but different functional diversity, right? They work in different domains. Cognitive diversity, they think about problems differently. Occupational diversity, they come from different, um, different communities of practice. Geographic diversity. And what the research shows time and time and again is that teams that are quite homogeneous, staffed by people that are roughly equivalent to one another, outperform teams that are diverse for a couple of months. But then you see an inversion in that chart where diverse team performance begins to exceed the performance of homogeneous teams after a very short period of time. Understanding the first part of that chart, why homogeneous teams tend to do better at first, makes a lot of intuitive sense, right? As people know each other, they can work together. But over time, what we begin to see is that if you have people that are too similar working together on teams, they develop too much complacency. They don't challenge each other enough. They don't bring in enough outside experience and enough social capital or enough relationships with other people across the organization to get the knowledge that we need to build our products, to engineer our processes more successfully. And I want to give you an example um, of what I mean by this uh, with some work I did with General Motors. So right at, uh, right at the late 2008-2009, right, right when the global economic recession was hitting and it was at its worst, you all read in the news about General Motors and the problems they were having. I started working with them at that time because they said, look, we need to figure out a way to do more with what we have currently and be able to increase and improve our processes significantly so that we can innovate more with the same or smaller number of resources. So they asked us to take a look at sort of their portfolio of engineering and product development processes to try to understand, you know, where might we optimize and improve those engineering processes across the company. 
And one of the first things we did was we looked to see where is most of the innovation coming from currently in the company. And what we found was quite surprising. And I'm going to put a chart up here that I hope you take a look at for just a second. The different colors on this bar graph represent different countries that were product homerooms for GM vehicles. And what that means is these were locations at which there was sort of a team owner and other team members working, usually in a co-located setting, but not always, um, on a team together. And the bars, the height of the bars, show how much new process innovation was coming out of teams located in each of these countries. We assembled this graph and showed it to uh, GM senior management, and they were really surprised. And the reason they were surprised has to do with the red bar on this graph. The red bar is the India Center, located in Bangalore. And that India Center was the newest of all the General Motors product development centers. They'd only been around for about five years. But you can see that by the end of 2008, they had surpassed every other country in process innovation across the company. And we wondered what might be happening on this team in India that's allowing them to do more process innovation than anybody else. So what we did to answer this question was we explored it from a number of different, different angles and different perspectives. What we found was if you took a look at the global product development network at the company, and here you can see all the stars up on the, the map here represent the different countries and their engineering centers, and the red star that you see there in the center is the center in India. And the lines represent simply which engineering centers have people on their team from other engineering centers. And what you notice when you look at this chart is that it's a quite disconnected network. That the India Center is the only engineering center across the globe that staffs its teams with remote workers from all across the rest of the globe. North America works pretty often with Europe, Germany and Sweden. Um, Australia works with um, Korea. Mexico and Brazil tend to work together. In the language of networks, or the sociology of networks, we call this a structural hole. There's a big hole in these overall networks at these companies that the India Center was filling. And what the India Center was able to do by virtue of having people on its teams, engineers on its teams from all over the globe, was to develop something like a bird's eye view of what was happening across the company. So imagine if you're a bird flying over Paris and you look down on the Arc de Triomphe, you can see all of the different neighborhoods of Paris and the act interactions and things, cool things that are happening across those neighborhoods in a very different way than you could if you were on the ground in any one of those neighborhoods. That's precisely what was happening with the India Center. They were able to understand and, and be able to examine how the Brazilian Center was building its vehicles and how the Germany Center was doing something different. And by comparing all of those different ways, they were able to arrive at new process improvements that built on, and in many cases, as that chart I showed you before um, demonstrated, exceeded the process innovation that was happening anywhere else across the company. Why were they able to do this? They were able to do this because of the diverse team composition pulling people that were close to markets in different areas, that had knowledge of the way things worked in different parts of the company. And this was an eye-opener for GM, who began to then restructure its product development teams to make sure that they had input from engineers from around the globe, rather than a small, homogeneous group of people working together in one setting. So when we think about the design of teams, and in particular, the kinds of structures of our distributed collaborations, it's really important that we make sure that we're de designing those teams with diversity in mind, that we're pulling people from different parts of the company who see things in different ways, who can react to those different ways of doing things in a manner that produces more collaboration and more process innovation. It's also important that we think about networks. We're not just picking a team for the human capital that appears on that team, not just for the skills that any one person brings, but we should also be picking that team for the network that all of those team members are bringing to it, trying to identify, for example, who has the kinds of connections and relationships with other people across the globe, other parts of our company, that can bring important knowledge into our team to improve our processes and to make our products better. So 
the first area we covered is structure and the importance of diversity. The next area I want to cover is about process. We've put our teams together. Hopefully, we've thought about this element of diversity. Now, what do we do to make sure that our teams remain successful? With you know, 30 years worth of research on distributed collaboration, this list could go on and on and on forever. And what I've tried to do today is to pick three things that I think are sort of counterintuitive, or at least non-obvious, that will be important takeaways for how we might think about managing the process of our teams. And there are three really simple takeaways. The first one is about keeping teams together. If you are browsing business books in the airport, you're going to see teaming, the notion of teaming popping up all over the place, right? The idea that, well, we don't have teams that stay together for a very long time, but we have flash teams that come together, do something, and disband. Those kinds of temporary teaming environments can be very useful in a variety of settings. But what the research shows us is that there are real benefits to keeping teams together, or at least you know, collaborations together, for some period of time. Our intuition would say that after working together for a couple of months or maybe a year or two, teams begin to get stale. There aren't so many fresh ideas that happen anymore. And we would be right to think that that's the case. But there's a trade-off between the amount of new information that's coming into a team and the ability of that team to develop a set of procedures and processes and norms to work together effectively. And the trade-off that we often see is that people sort of select too much for uh, we want newness and under-select on the kinds of cohesive and managed and manicured relationships that develop on teams over time. So the actual performance trajectory of many teams is that they do better the longer they stay together, at least up until a point. And I'll tell you a little bit about more about what that point is in just a second. So the first major issue here about process is we want to keep our teams together to allow them to bring in the benefits of that diverse information, learn how to work together routinely such that their performance increases. The second major point about process I want to make is about time. Every team that we ever assemble for any reason, any kind of collaboration, whether it's co-located people or whether it's distributed, has some kind of du time duration attached to it. Whether it's the duration of a product launch or some kind of series of brainstorming sessions, there's some beginning of the team with some at least vision of a set of milestones or an end date. As we think about the way that processes on teams evolve over time, there are three different patterns that begin to emerge um, that the research has shown that are really important. And these patterns seem to persist regardless of whether we're talking about string quartets, whether we're talking about large software development teams, or whether we're looking at really big, massively online kinds of communities uh, that you see sometimes in crowdfunding kinds of uh, environments or mass education, like MPOG kind of environments. Um, and here are the three patterns. The first one is that communication patterns begin to form in about the first 1 16th or so of all the meetings that teams have. And what I mean by communication patterns are, who's going to talk the most? Who is going to be antagonistic? Who is going to be helpful? Will we be giving really useful comments or not? Those patterns of communication form very, very early in the life cycle of any team, extremely early. And so if we begin to see patterns like too many negative discussions happening, or people being overtly critical too early on such that it's stifling the contributions of our team members, if we don't fix those in the first you know, three or four meetings that we have together as a team, the likelihood that we'll ever be able to surmount those obstacles is extremely low. So we have to really make sure to manage those communication patterns very early. The second major point I want to raise here is that roles form early as well. Not quite as early as teams, but still early. And by roles, I mean here um, leadership roles. Who's going to take the onus for discussion in the team? I mean devil's advocate kinds of roles. Who's going to say, well, maybe we should look at this again and reevaluate? Um, criticism. Who is going to be mean to other people on teams, right? Task roles. Who's going to be managing tasks? Wh whether we assign these formally or not, or think that as leaders of teams, we've sort of designated people to fulfill these roles, what we know from the research is that these roles tend to emerge very quickly 
in about the first one-eighth or so of all meetings that teams have. And I should say that both of these, for the communication patterns or the roles, the research here is not just confined to teams meeting in face-to-face -face settings, but teams that are meeting in all kinds of distributed contexts as well. So communication patterns form early, roles form early, and attempts then to sort of shift the way that people are communicating or what roles people play halfway through the project or three quarters often don't work very well. So we have a window of opportunity that tends to be in the first several meetings that we have with our team to really get the proper kind of a process in place that we feel is most effective for good team functioning. The last point I want to mention here in terms of time is that regardless of the kinds of teams that we study, we see a very, very similar pattern. And that is that teams tend to have two speeds, moderate and fast. And the fast gear shifts in about halfway through the duration of the given project. So if you're thinking about a product life cycle and a revamp that let's say happens at 18 months, right? it's right in the middle at that midpoint between zero and 18 months that the pace of the team begins to shift. You may say, well, that doesn't sound like a problem at all. right? I want the team and I want my collaborative endeavor right, to be picking up speed as it moves along. The problem is that if we leave the fast pace to the end of the project, we often don't have time to correct problems. We don't have time to intervene when things aren't going the right kind of way. And what the research shows again and again is that we have more and more firefighting that needs to be done at the end of a project if teams haven't sort of kicked up into high gear about halfway through. Firefighting is not a huge issue unless you have multiple products in your portfolio. Because to fight a fire on one project, what do you have to do? Steal resources from another project in your portfolio, which then starts to push your whole portfolio behind. So it's extremely important that we make sure to set early milestones for our teams such that we don't let them sort of coast along at moderate speed and then pick things up towards the end. But regular sets of deliverables and milestones will ensure that we keep the kind of pace that we can intervene in to make course corrections as we need. Final area that I want to highlight here in terms of process is about experts. Maybe we'll call them stars. We often think that one of the key things we want to do is to pick the smartest and the brightest people and put them on our team together because then we'll have the best output. And that intuition feels really good, doesn't it? Because we want smart, bright people. We hire smart, bright people in our company. So we want to put them together. But what this graph shows, and this was done um, as a composite of a number of different teams across industries, that when we have people who are experts in a similar domain, right? This are sort of our star employees in very similar areas, and we put them together on teams, they tend to not, the teams don't do as well as when we have star performers on our teams that are from different domains. Why might that, that be the case? Well, when you have a lot of people who have very similar expertise and view themselves as sort of the top of the class, there's often a lot of fighting and discussion that happens amongst them about what's the sort of the best way to carry on with the process. Initially, that fighting and discussion is really good because a certain amount of task conflict in teams is extremely healthy. But over time, what you begin to see is a lot of jockeying for position amongst our star members and disagreements over sort of who has the best approach and who doesn't that actually impede team performance. The most successful teams are ones where we pick star performers that are in different areas that can be clearly their subject matter expert. That doesn't mean that we still don't have people who are sort of lots of expertise in an area on our teams when we pick stars that are coming from different backgrounds. Because if we design our teams with that first principle of networks in mind, that means our star performers can reach out in a non-threatening setting to their colleagues to get information and help them to make uh, pronouncements or to make recommendations for what we should be doing better on our team. So it's really important that we think about, of course, establishing our teams with people who are top employees that are highly regarded, but that there isn't too much expertise overlap in those areas, lest we get a lot of infighting that impedes team performance. So taking these three areas that we've talked about, making sure that teams stay together over time, managing the kind of communication patterns that form on teams, and trying to reduce star performers, uh, my, my research team and I did a big project with SAP um, a number of years ago. And SAP, what we did is a, um, 
a set of pilot studies where we assembled um, 73 teams together from across the company that were doing primarily product development work. And we trained those teams to do those three things that we talked about. We trained them in sort of the ability to, how they, how they could productively stay together over a long period of time. We trained them how to intervene in team discussions early to make sure they got the kind of communication patterns they wanted, the roles they wanted, that they didn't wait till that midpoint to begin to kick into high gear. And we made sure to assemble those teams in ways that didn't have too many competing stars. And we compared the group of 70 plus teams to a separate group of teams that didn't get that same kind of intervention. Um, and here's what we, intervention, here's what we found. If you look at this performance chart really quickly, you see increase of performance along the, the vertical axis there. That these teams that were in our training sample peaked in their performance at about two and a half to three and a half years. So after these development teams got together, made it through one release cycle, and we're on to the second and almost the beginning of a third release cycle, their performance as a team was at the highest. And this high level of performance exceeded by a factor of four the highest level of performance for teams that weren't in that intervention, that were designed without consideration of any of those principles. So when we think about the way that we engage in these processes, it's really important that we remember these couple of things. That performance is highest when we keep teams together for a while. And what the research suggests is that somewhere in the neighborhood, at least for software development teams, seems to be in the area between two and four years that we want to make sure that we're working early on to intervene in patterns of communication, of, um, of, of process and speech that we think are not going to be extremely effective early on and change those, and that we make sure that we are designing our teams with experts in non-overlapping domains. OK, so that's process. Learning is my favorite one, because learning is a huge issue for large organizations. How do we continually make sure that we're educating our workforce in the right way and that they're learning from their colleagues from across the organization? I'm going to give you two numbers, which are pretty scary. The first one here, 47%. This number was, um, was reported by a recent Harris poll, which suggested that on distributed teams, 47% of workers cite corporate amnesia as a serious problem. Now, you know there's a serious problem when we've got a buzzword for something, right? Corporate amnesia, what does that mean? It means that the company as a whole knows something that the team didn't know that the company knew. So we're recreating the wheel in many cases because we simply don't know what other people or other functions in our company know. 47% of distributed team workers cite corporate amnesia as a problem. The second number, 430,000, um, comes from some research by, done by a woman named Dorothy Leonard at the Harvard Business School, who suggests that on top of the normal replacement costs for employees, corporate amnesia contributes about $400,000 extra dollars to replacement costs. That is, we're hiring people who then have to take a long time to get up to speed on things that we as a company already know, but that employee doesn't know. How do we deal with problems of corporate amnesia? They exist everywhere. My own profession in academia, we're certainly not immune to corporate amnesia. And this cartoon up, up on the slides from The New Yorker, oops, is one of my favorites. Um, it shows two scientists working in a laboratory, and one says to the other, I see by the current issue of Lab News Ridgeway that you've been working on the same problem that I've been working on for the last 20 years. Right? So these happen all the time. And I've worked with companies with a workforce no greater than 50 who spent $3 million trying to acquire some knowledge to develop a product, only to find out that they already had that knowledge to develop the product internally. And you might say, that's not a very well-functioning company. But the reality is that we, as organizations, know way more than we're able to communicate and disseminate to our employees. This kind of knowledge is what we call, in sort of fancy academic terms, organizational meta-knowledge. And what is meta-knowledge? Meta-knowledge is pretty simple. It's knowledge about who knows what, like a mental Rolodex of who's worked on what projects and who's an expert in what area. But it's also knowledge of who knows whom. And we know that both of these are equally important in order to get jobs done within our companies. Because simply knowing that someone has the kind of knowledge or expertise that we need is no guarantee that I'll be able to get access to those people, is it? 
We know, for example, that a lot of times we need to have someone make an introduction for us because it takes time and effort for someone to be willing to sit down with us, especially if they don't know us very well. Even if we have the most open culture, it takes time and effort for them to want to sit down and walk us through what it is they know and help us. So knowing who knows what and knowing who knows whom is extremely important for us to be able to make sure we reduce these problems of corporate amnesia. So how do we typically develop meta-knowledge? How do we typically develop knowledge of who knows what and who knows whom? Well, we do it by sitting in meetings, don't we? Hearing what reports of what other people have done in their projects. That's one way. We do it by walking around the proverbial water cooler. Whether or not we have a real water cooler or not is beside the point. But we learn through informal interactions with our employees as they talk about different projects they've done, frustrations that they've had. We begin to develop a sense of who knows what and who knows whom. The conference room and the water cooler, though, don't scale very well, do they? And they don't lend themselves to a distributed workforce in which we're trying to pull in the collaborative efforts of many people from across our company. So how might we scale this ability to develop meta-knowledge? A couple years ago, I had a funny experience when I was on Facebook that led me to uh, the project I'm going to talk about in just a second here. I was, um, was on Facebook, and I saw a post on my wall from a woman that I know eh, relatively, relatively well, but not, not super well. Um, her name is Margie Avery. And uh, Margie was an acquisitions editor at the MIT Press. They publish boring academic books that you wouldn't have any interest in reading, most likely. Um, and Margie publishes good books, though. Um, and Margie posted on Facebook, hooray, our South by Southwest Eye panel, entitled New Knowledge Ecosystems, How and What We Know, was accepted. This was a strange post for me to see because I'd known Margie as an acquisitions editor for a press, not as someone who was interested in digital infrastructure and who was putting on conferences about digital infrastructure. I knew Margie enough to know that had nothing to do with her job. What was also surprising to me was that she began to receive a lot of responses to that comment by people that I knew, that I had no idea that Margie knew. And so if you look at that list, there's a number of names on there. Uh, Christian Sandvig, for example, who's a professor at the University of Michigan. Um, I know Christian, but I didn't know that Margie and Christian knew each other. And as I began to look at this post, you can see that my mental Rolodex began to expand, as did my network of knowledge about who knew whom. And I began to wonder, could tools like Facebook, but sort of more social tools for the enterprise, be useful in helping to distribute or enhance meta-knowledge across our companies. And I was fortunate enough then to work with Discover, the credit card company, on a project to sort of test this hypothesis. And here's what we did. Discover was going to roll out a, a new enterprise net social networking tool uh, made by Jive Software. And the, the Facebook, the platform, the Jive platform, looked a lot like Facebook. So you had your wall, you, you know, in your profile, and people could post messages, and you could share direct messages with people, and you could link to documents. And so right before Discover rolled out this tool across their workforce, we began a, a sort of natural experiment. Here's what we did. We gave one group access to the tool, as a marketing group, access to this tool to use for six months. And be, before we let them have access to this tool, we administered a sort of battery of uh, surveys to them to assess how accurate their meta-knowledge was. In other words, how accurately could they identify who across all 13 departments in marketing had what knowledge and who across all 13 departments in marketing knew each other such that if I needed to get help from someone, I could reach out to someone and they could make a connection to me. At that same time period, we had another group that happened to be in operations who took the same survey but didn't use the tool over the six-month period. At the end of the six months, we then administered that exact same survey again to see if there's any change from time one to time two and instituted a number of different um, sort of experimental controls to be able to isolate that those changes, if there were any, were due to the tool. And here's what we found. People in the marketing team began to develop a broader awareness of things that their coworkers were doing simply by reading their everyday boring interactions with one another on this Jive tool. They also were developing more of a sense of who their colleagues knew. And one of my favorite stories, the one that's highlighted in red here, I'll tell you just extremely quickly. There was a woman in marketing who 
was asked by her boss to develop a, um, a report that took some data that were in their big marketing database. But the database is gigantic, and so in order to chunk it into a manageable size for her to do the analysis, she needed a script that would pull out the relevant data. She didn't know how to write the script, and she asked around if anybody that she knew could write the script, and nobody did. But she heard from one of her coworkers that she had heard that there was someone in the IT group who had written a script like this in the past. Now, it's not IT's job to go and write scripts for people in marketing to be able to access their databases better, but she thought she would try anyway. So she looked him up on the corporate people finder, and she saw his picture and his phone number, and she called him up and left a voicemail saying, please, this is kind of urgent, I could use your help. Two days go by, no response. She sends an email, two days go by, still no response. Right? He's busy, he's in IT, it's not his job to help marketing. It's a 15,000 person company. I totally get it. She then is on the Jive platform and she sees a picture that her, one of her good friends at Jive posted of some sort of social event where she's standing next to the guy from IT that she had been trying to contact. And she recognized him because of the, his picture on PeopleFinder. So she immediately walks over to the desk of her friend and says, I didn't know you knew him. She says, oh yeah, we went to college together, we're old buddies. She said, well, can you ask him to help me write this script? Or at least to call me back? She said, sure. She sends him a text. He texts her back immediately and says, have her call me in five minutes. She calls him in five minutes. The next day, the script is written for her. This is one of these sort of basic examples, right, about how the kinds of mundane, everyday interactions that we see on these tools can begin to expand pretty broadly to help build our awareness of who knows what and whom. What we found after examining and comparing these two teams was that knowledge of who knew what in marketing, and that's um, marketing, you can see the blue bar here on this bar chart is their accuracy before using the tool and the red bar is after, increased by 31%. And there's no increase in operations over the same time period. What's even more remarkable is that knowledge of who knows whom for the average employee in marketing increases by a whopping 88%. So people really had no very good way of knowing who were the communication partners of my work colleagues. And after just being exposed to information happening on this tool over a six month period, their accuracy shot way up which translates into improvements on these teams in terms of work duplication and increases in product and process innovation. So if you're tracking what I'm saying so far, what you'll see is that there's learning that's happening here, but it's happening in a very different way than we think about learning. So imagine that you're looking at a, um, at a point to list painting and you're looking at it really close up. All you see are a number of dots that are really difficult to discriminate, right? what one person did on this project, or what someone did on that project, or what question they asked for someone by themselves are relatively meaningless. But as you begin to step back away from those dots, you begin to see a more broad panoramic of what that picture actually looks like. And those individual dots now render themselves in this beautiful Matisse painting. That's much like the learning that happens via social tools within our companies. By itself, each little bit of information appears somewhat inconsequential, but our ability to assemble all of those little dots into a rich picture of what and whom our colleagues know represents a really important learning that helps our teams in collaborative and in distributed settings work more effectively. So if you think about the keys here, the first is that we need to be aware that learning happens in an ambient kind of a way that we become aware of communications that are occurring around us. And our goal has to be to make sure that we take that awareness and we stitch it together in ways that develop these rich pictures of what and whom our coworkers know. And we have to remember that that accumulation happens slowly over time. One of the most interesting things that happened with that Discover study was when we went to people who had dramatic increases in the accuracy of what and whom they knew, and we asked them, was that social tool useful in helping you to improve your accuracy? Almost to a person, people said, no, it wasn't useful. No, yet our statistics showed that it was. And it wasn't until we began to ask them to say, well, how exactly did you learn that person X knew this? Were they able to say, oh yeah, I remember seeing one time on the tool that they posted this and then they posted that, and then those two things together made me realize that they must know this. And what our data show is that those inferences they were making are actually quite accurate. 
So to the extent that we can, use tools that help people to passively reach across silos, whether they're tools like JiveN or Slack or other collaborative kinds of chat tools that leave a record of our communication, it's very useful for helping to develop that kind of meta-knowledge. Interaction is the I in split. And here's the rub about interaction. When we think about distributed collaborations, and we think about all of the technologies that need to be in place to allow us to be in a distributed kind of environment, there's a somewhat of a paradox. That the tools that are the richest in helping us convey meaning, the tools that are the richest in helping us understand what's going on within our organizations, right, how people are feeling about things, are the good old fashioned tools of being in the same room and talking with them. But the kinds of tools that are making distributed collaboration possible are these lean media that are on the left side of that chart. Things like email, uh, groupware, which some companies are still using, believe it or not. Right? And these very lean kinds of communication tools help us to distribute information, but not communicate a sense of place. And what happens in these kinds of settings then is that we begin to make attributions about our employee, our fellow employees. For example, we take beliefs um, and our values, and we select data and interpret that data and draw conclusions based on that data that are often unfavorable to our fellow work colleagues that are in different settings. So for example, if we see something like um, there was a teleconference that was scheduled for 9.30 and, and 9 o'clock and John was late, then we begin to make inferences about why that happens because we don't have the richness of the context. Right? John was late, he knew exactly when it started. He must not care, uh, he's not a team player. And we begin to recycle those beliefs over time. One of the key things that we found in working with companies like Rakuten, for example, was that the best way to beat down these bad inferences that we make is by encouraging a fair amount of informal personal communication. The more that we can get people talking about non-work-related topics, the more they build familiarity and patience with one another such that they're not making negative attributions when they lack the data to know exactly why somebody did something. And that means we need to encourage people, as in our Rakuten examples, right, of talking about soccer, of talking about their hobbies in ways that allow them to build some kind of camaraderie. So if we think about this, the tools that enable distributed work make it difficult for us to connect. And our responsibility is that we make sure that help, we help employees to figure out ways at the beginning of our meetings, through video channels, to get a sense of the context in which other people are working and operating, such that they're willing to make more charitable attributions of their behavior rather than negative attributions of their behavior. And we can do this through talk, right? making sure we create opportunities for informal interaction, asking our employees to share personal bits of information. We can do it by going, by helping um, bring people from one site to an offsite, for example, for a short period of time so they can get to know each other and strike up conversations and relationships. And we do it by seeing. Video is an extremely powerful tool from what we've seen in our work of being able to give people a sense of place. When you see things in people's cubes or homes and you react to them like, hey, I'm a fan of that same team, or I've got kids too, we start to build up a repertoire of data through which we make positive attributions. The last point I want to make is about talk. And it's very simple. It's two key points here. Talk is so important for the way that we function in any kind of collaborative setting. But people tend to dominate discussion. And if we have small teams, certain people, if we have a four-person team, the research shows two people do more than 70% of the talking, whether that's in person or whether that's typing. If we have a six-person team, three people do 77% of the talking. If it's an eight-person team, three people do more than 86% of the discussion. It's absolutely essential that we, as leaders of teams, are making sure that we are helping the voiceless gain a voice. I know that sounds very aspirational and pie in the sky, but what it means is that we have to actively work to help people who don't have the natural inclination to speak up in larger group settings to make sure that they air their, their um, complaints, that they share their positive ideas, and that they make, we make sure that they're positive contributors to our team settings.
Because if left to themselves, what people will do on our teams is recede into the background as several players take a very dominant role. The final point also that I'll leave you from the data here about talk is that people in teams love to discuss information and data that they think other people already know. And that sounds very counterintuitive to some of the things we talked about before about assembling diverse teams where people can bring in information that other people don't know. But what the research shows is that when we have teams that get together in a face-to-face -face context, they love to talk about things that they know other people know. And there's a number of reasons why that's the case, and I've listed several of them up here for you. And that problem is even more compounded in distributed settings, where it's even less likely that people will talk about information that's not widely known or held in common on the team. If this is a natural tendency in teams, and we're assembling people on teams because of their diversity, we have to make sure to actively manage our teams in such a way that they we're getting the contributions from people who have diverse information, unique perspectives to share, so that we're actively cultivating rich discussions and collaborations on our team. So we want to make sure that a few people don't dominate and that we are surfacing uncommon knowledge because the natural tendencies in so many of these teams is to do exactly the opposite, to have few people discuss a lot and to have people talk about things that everybody already knows about in the first place. So what I've tried to do over the last couple of minutes, hopefully in a relatively entertaining way with some good examples, is to talk through this idea of what causes splits on teams. So if we think about structure, process, learning, interaction and talk. These are the levers that we have to make sure that we don't create the San Andreas fault that breaks our distributed collaborations. We want to make sure that as we manage those different levers, we're doing so in such a way that we don't create that tension that will cause our teams to rupture and we break the good positive benefits that we can get from our distributed collaborations. So I think our time is up. I thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'm around for the rest of the day to answer them for you. Thank you so much. <clears throat>